couple other questions for you. They'll be fairly straightforward. The first one is, I'm, I want to do this. I want to go forward with it and, and figure it out. Um, what, what, if, what if I wanted someone like you to come to my local church and to help us with this for an event, for a weekend, to figure out, uh, like you said, put your arm around, the, yeah. but in person... And and how how would I how would I contact you how would I how would I get how would is that even possible and and what would I do to do that? yeah I, I do uh, I do twenty or thirty uh, weekends a year with choirs in all sorts of walks of life classic choirs and churches where they've had a choir forever and young churches where they've just put the choir together um, and uh, and I love them every weekend is different than every other weekend you know but. Uh, but they all tend to they all tend to have a similar predictable really wonderful result so if you want to do that the best way to get in touch with me is uh, is uh, probably emailing me and my uh, <laughs> my email address you have to write this down is vox not rocks that's spelled v is in victor o x n o t R O X, and if you want to figure out what that means, you have to look up Luke 19 verse 40 <laughs> uh, at AOL.com. Okay. Vox not rocks at AOL.com, and you can also go on my website called WorshipLeadingChoir.com, and uh, and get a little bit of uh, information about what that weekend can look like. Great, thank you. the The last question I have is is your book is full, which I, I've read the, the book. What I, one of the things I love about it is the stories in it. Uh, I, think, I think it's great to learn information, but it's even better when you start of, you get to step into that per, person's world through a story, oh, and you have some great stories. And I wondered if you could, could sort of prime us for a, an experience or a story out of your choir life uh, in terms of the churches that you've been in that can inspire some of the uh, the worship leaders out there that 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 are, don't have a choir yet. There are so many possibilities. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about a story that uh, doesn't include a choir. Okay. But it's a story that for me started everything. Back in the 1980s, before some of you were born. Uh, I was minister of music in a wonderful church in Southern California in a little town called West Lake Village. And the church was a, 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 a functioned like a non-denominational church. It was actually a member of a denomination, but, but it functioned kind of independently. And uh, it was an evangelical church, not charismatic, uh, but, but very open and very contemporary feeling. Uh, one of the things that characterized my life growing up was the fact that I went, I always went to wonderful churches, but none of them, and this is not unusual for the 50s and 60s when I was growing up, none of them really understood worship in the way that we're coming to understand it now, uh, corporate worship in the body of Christ. And so uh, on a Monday night, I got a phone call from my pastor greatest human being I've ever known. His name is Larry DeWitt. And Larry called me on Monday night and I could tell he'd been crying. And, uh, and uh, so I, I sat down to listen to what he had to say. And he said he had just been to, a, to an event at the Vineyard Church in Orange County. And there were about 150 pastors there and they'd all come together for a week of meetings and they were sharing back and forth and learning and teaching and taking notes. And he said that the day went great, but he said that night, because of all these pastors who were there, they wanted to hold some open meetings, and they invited the whole congregation to come. And uh, every night was going to be a teaching from one of these pastors. So he went that night, and they filled up the place with a couple thousand people. And, and he said, uh, just a few people with guitars stood up on the platform and began to lead in worship and everybody stood up and started to worship but he said it was different than what he had uh, anticipated he said 
uh, worship wasn't done in 10 minutes, and it wasn't done in 20 minutes, and it wasn't done in a half hour, and it wasn't done in 40 minutes. And, and he, he looked around at the people around him, and what he saw just ripped his guts out. He said, uh, he said what he saw was people, tears streaming down their faces, and hands lifted in gestures of surrender or, or of exaltation. And, uh, and he said uh, some were uh, prostrate before God. And for all the world, he said, it looked like there were people being healed all around him, you know, in this whole congregation, um, either physically or maybe emotionally or relationally, but something was happening. It was, it was the pure presence of God among his people. And, uh, and uh, he didn't know what it was from having not experienced it before, but he knew it was real. That much he knew. There wasn't anybody on the platform that was working it up, whipping people up, or getting them to jump through hoops. So it, did, it undid him. And it, so much so that even after the teaching, uh, he called me. It was late, 10.30 at night or something. And with a, with a real catch in his voice, he said, you know, could you come down here tomorrow night and join me for this? Because if you have a similar experience, it might mean something significant for the worship life in our church. So I said, sure. And I, I went down, but I prepared not to have my world rocked. You know, <laughs> I, I, I've been around, I've seen stuff, you know. But so much for preparation. Uh... I had a similar experience, I, including the tears. And, uh, and so we were so moved by what we'd experienced that we went back to our church and we tried to plug in some of what we'd seen. But we didn't know what we were seeing or why we'd seen it. And so a lot of it just had to kind of wait for further development later on in the life of the church. But what my pastor had created in bringing me down to this and, and having seen, letting me observe what was happening in the lives and hearts of these people as they worship God transparently. He created a worship monster. You know, I, I started reading everything I could read. Uh, you know, everything from, from uh, stuff that I was comfortable with theologically at the moment. Uh, John MacArthur's ultimate priority and some things that move on over to the middle, you know, Jack Hayford's Worship His Majesty and then over to some stuff by Judson Cornwall who writes mostly the Charismatics and Pentecostals and, and I, you know, I'm taking all this stuff in and I'm taking notes and I, and I didn't do anything about it, you know, I just kind of carried it around a little file folder waiting for something to be birthed, you know, some, some uh, uh, epiphany, you know, from God that would say, okay, now put it all into practice. And that wasn't to happen until later. But what I recognized later when, it, when finally it, that stuff was birthed was that that was the moment that God opened my heart to the fact that there's more about worship than I had ever realized before. And more happens in worship, more needs to happen in worship. And even though there wasn't a choir involved in that particular night and that experience. That experience and, and what it did in me has influenced everything that has come to me uh, and, and that I, I've discovered and that I'm still discovering right now related to the choir and its role in worship than anything else and all the experiences in choirs that I had previous to that point. So. I'm not sure if that answered the question that you asked, but that was the story I felt like telling. That's, that's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks thanks for uh, taking the time. Appreciate it.